All right, everyone, we're going to get going. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. Significant amount of registration and participation. This is amazing. I think a lot of us are very tired of Zoom meetings, but it's just amazing to see everyone here. Thank you so much uh, for joining. So my name is Ali Rezai. I'm the CEO of Shaw Lab Group, a group of dental lab based in Ontario um, since uh, 78 years ago. And today, I'll be introducing Michael Lino to you and also let him have the, um, have the webinar. So a little bit about Michael Lino. Michael Lino was born to be a dental technologist. So his grandmother was in dental field. His aunt and his mom are in dental field. In fact, his mom is a program coordinator at the University of Toronto Faculty of Dentistry. His dad is a dental technologist, registered dental technologist running the implant division of Shaw GTA. And his wife is also a dental technologist. He has two boys. We don't know what they're going to be, but most likely dental technologist too. We do not know that. So um, Michael has been working uh, for over 20 years uh, at uh, our Shaw Toronto location, recently at Shaw GTA. He started with us at uh, age of 18. He became a registered dental technologist at the age of 21, most likely making him the youngest uh, RDT at the time in Ontario. He has been contributing to the CDTO, the college in various capacities. He's lectured at the University of Toronto. And today um, there is no doubt that he's leading one of the most successful labs in the country. He's also a certified green belt uh, manufacturing champion, which is all about quality, consistency, and efficiency. And this is just a quick picture of Shaw Lab Group. Uh, and uh, after this slide, I will hand it over to Michael Lino. At the very top left, you see, you see the picture of Shaw London led by Jamie Scott, a uh, registered dental technologist in the middle top, Shaw Ottawa, led by Kevin Deset, another registered dental technologist. Um, on top right uh, corner, you see Shaw Kingston, led by Aaron Kick, another registered dental technologist. And the very bottom, you see the happy, large, uh, great team of dental technologists in Shaw. GTA, uh, led by Michael Lino. Michael, I will hand it over to you. But before that, if you have any question along the way, please put it in the question and answer. We're going to get to the question and answer at the end of the presentation. Thanks a lot and enjoy the webinar. Michael, over to you. Well, thank you, Ali. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I know it's a, a lot for everybody to make the time to join these things. Uh, as, it, as Ali mentioned, uh, we're a fairly large group of laboratories. And, you know, throughout the time and the years that we've been doing this, uh, you start seeing some common issues and problems and situation in the laboratory um, amongst the cases. And the purpose of this webinar um, is kind of discuss uh, some of those challenges we see um, so it helps you improve uh, the work and with the lab that you're working with and be more successful with cases. Um, some of the stuff may you may know about, some of them might be new, new things and new information for you. Um, what we're going to kind of structure it in is four categories. So we're going to talk about impressions, understanding impressions, uh, challenges that the lab faces. We'll talk about uh, records, uh, providing the information the lab needs. We'll talk about teamwork, um, improving the relationship with the lab. And we'll talk a little bit about implant placement. Before getting into it, I, I do want to kind of just briefly talk about dentistry in general. So, you know, dentistry is beautiful because it is art. Um, every dentist, every team, every technician, they're all artists. And no two patients are alike. Uh, every single crown is different and unique. Um, from chair side uh, to the lab, everything is handcrafted. And because of that, there are a lot of challenges that we deal with. It's just not like normal manufacturing where you're making the same thing over and over and over again. Um, they really are unique and, and different from one another. So in my presentation, I wanna to work together, uh, review some of these common challenges uh, so we could be more mindful and improve our work of art. So one of the largest challenges uh, dentists and technicians face is communication and teamwork. Um, this is uh, just a clip 
that I put on from an old TV show, uh, you know, whose line is it anyways? And what it is, there's one actor um, essentially with his hands behind his back, giving instructions to the other actor who ha who's actually um, doing a task and they're trying to complete this task, but the other person can't see. Um, and the reason I'm sharing that is it, it's a little bit like the dynamics of a dentist in a lab relationship is, you know, there's a patient in front of them and there's a task at hand to make a restoration and make uh, the patient smile and have a beautiful restoration um, where the dentist uh, is there and can see the patient and see all the details, um, but is not the one actually working on it. And there's a lab technician that's working on the case, but doesn't get to see the inf information or see the patient in person. Um, some little labs do, some chair side labs, but not majority don't. And so the tricky part of this communication and teamwork is, you know, the, the, the ability to give the whole picture to the lab. And what I mean by that is when you have a patient, um, essentially what the dentist is doing is creating an exact copy of that through impressions, um, making a sketch or information. And when, and that's the information you're giving to the laboratory to say, well, this is what my patient looks like. And when there's, um, you know, when there's poor impressions or incomplete records or no teamwork um, or planning, you know, you kind of get in the scenario where the, this is my patient and the lab is kind of working with that to restore something. But, but providing that pro pro proper information, you're actually making a copy of that patient. And now the laboratory can actually do a better job in fabricating that case. So as I said, we're gonna talk about impressions first. We'll talk about trays, uh, impression accuracy, impression copings, and digital impressions. So if you ask pretty much any technician, uh, what do they prefer? They're always gonna say full arch. Um, you know, whether it's a stock tray um, or custom tray, um, custom tray is gonna be preferred or digital impression, but a full arch. And that goes for the master and opposing because Again, when we're talking about the whole picture, the laboratory wants to get as much information as possible and you're trying to reproduce that. So that's why laboratories like that. There's, there's um, you know, obviously other options like you see in quad trays, um, which is not as ideal. Yes, they serve their purposes, um, but essentially that's only giving you half the information. So when you're talking about a case like this and you're trying to do a rest, or the technician's trying to do a, a canine and they don't have another side to mirror, there's guesswork that goes into it. They don't actually get to see it. So um, the other challenge is, you know, you can't do working and balancing contacts. You can't give better occlusion or better uh, cases. It's a lot harder to set the bites. It um, makes it uh, very difficult because you don't have as many uh, centric stops. And the other thing is that you start seeing quad trays used more and more, and I understand because they're quicker, um, but they should essentially should only be used for single crowns. And you start seeing this very often in the lab where you start getting bigger cases um, for bridge work. And, and essentially like, how do we, we have like one point contact to balance it? And is the bike gonna be correct? All these things are gonna cause um, guesswork for the, the lab that you're working with. And it's gonna be a little bit more difficult uh, to, to manage. The other thing that we see a lot is triple trays. And, um, you know, triple trays have the same uh, issues as quad trays, you know, only giving you half arch, uh, not giving full information. Um, there's some issues with stability um, of the trays. So when you when you talk, when you start seeing, you know, plastic trays, um, they're more flexible. And what ends up happening when a patient sometimes bites on those, they might bite on the the, the, the lingual bracing arch and actually flexes those tray. And once the, the impression's set and pulls it out, it flexes back and it actually causes distortions. Um, so metal trays are better for that because they don't flex as much, um, but there's challenges in those as well. Uh, there's, uh, with these metal trays, it, they are designed to have impression material that actually covers around these bars. Um, that's where it gets this rigidity and strength from. Um, a lot of the times we see this where on both these impressions, they, they don't cover. And it's just a fabric in between that makes it flexible. So um, putting stone in there can distort the impression, um, especially when there's thin walls. And if you have a deep margin like this, it's very flexible and fragile. Um, so it makes it a little bit trickier and easier for problems to happen there. The other thing that we see um, a lot is 
you know, the type of impressions, right? And, and you know, I've had this discussion um, a lot with, with doctors and, and, the, and the thing is, usually it's like they have an impression. We understand the challenges, you know, you have a challenging patient, you're trying to take an impression. Um, it's not always easy. And, you know, but usually you take these multiple traces and you just send it to the lab and see if the lab can work with it. Um, but that's not the best solution because anytime that you feel, well, it's not the greatest, let's see if the lab can work with it. There, there are always going to be issues for the lab. Yes, we can work with it. Yes, there's things that we can do to try to, to make it manage, but we're putting more errors or room for errors or more gaps work into it. So, you know, whether it's, you know, patients biting outside the tray, if there's gauze on the margins, um, distortions, something like this, where it looks fine, the margins look fine, but there's actually a void. And once the stone gets underneath it, it's going to rip everything apart. Not enough impression material. This is kind of what I meant about the metal trays. They do, the impression material is not wrapped around. They actually sometimes rip from the tray. When you pull them out of the mouth, um, it can be dislodged that way. And then obviously distortions and poles and mesh going through. These are all things that really, you know, should be evaluated closely um, before sending it because you don't know what's going to happen. It's either the lab is, let's put it this way, almost every lab, they, they don't like calling dentists to say bad news. It, it, anybody just hates being bearer of bad news. Um, so when you're putting it, uh, a case like this out to the lab, it's either they're going to try to work with it and not call the doctor and do their best with it. And then hopefully it works out or maybe there's issues or they are calling the doctor and they're always the bearer of bad news. And now you have to bring the patient back and, and it's an, another appointment. Um, the other thing um, that we see often is just margins. So the understanding of, you know, we can't, once an impression's poured, uh, we can't see what's underneath the tissue or the stone because once, if it's, you know, these are two impressions. So this was the first one, this is the second one. We can't actually remove that. We try to guess margins, but if we can't really see it, I'll give you an example on this one here. This was the first impression. Um, if we were to try to guess this, we're just gonna trim the margin and we can think it's a knife edge here, but you can't see it because you can't actually remove that stone. But then on the next impression, you kind of see that there actually is a shoulder um, and it's different. So um, we, we, can't, we can't see what's under and read a margin what's underneath. And essentially when we have something like this, well, this is an extreme case, but let's say there is some distortion on it and you see margin from A to B, you're guessing you're guessing the, the margin line in between. And that's what the lab technician is doing, it's guesswork. Um, another challenge we see a lot too is undercuts. Uh, so prepping knife edge, uh, you know, when we can't, knife edges on, are, are, are not the greatest because there's, you know, issues with the undercuts uh, where you can't see them sometimes when they're prepped. And then you got to understand is that, yes, the lab can make reduction copings um, to, you know, reduce uh, some of the undercuts. Uh, but the problem is anytime there's a surface and anytime there's an extra surface, um, let's say there's undercut here and undercut here, it's, it's increasing the amount of error that's going to be, uh, be able to mimic chair side. Um, so yes, we can make reduction copings, but the more surfaces you have to reduce, the chances that it's gonna be less successful. Um, so ideally getting chamfers and not having those undercuts, it, it, it makes it a lot easier. With preps in general, another thing with zirconia, I know we in, in email, when we're talking about lithium to silix, um, it's just the type of margins that are prepped. And kind of what I was just saying about knife edge, um, zirconia is not a big fan of that because when you're talking about uh, load and forces, especially when there's a cement gap and the cement is not set, um, if it's, uh, if, if there is no seating stop and with the knife edge prep, and when the patient bites down, let's say you're trying in the crown and you haven't put the cement in, you want to see if the bite and they bite hard, what ends up happening that this presses down and then the forces bind the, the, the margins bind on the, on the, on the, on the knife edge and can actually snap the crown because the thinnest point is up here and the thinnest points are on the margins. But when you have a nice chamfer or shoulder, um, there's actually a stop there uh, for the cement gap. Um, so it's definitely better to do shoulder and chamfers. Um, it also allows the zirconia to be a little bit thicker in that area, so they're not so thin. Regarding uh, implant impressions, uh, 
you know, we, we get a lot, the, the question asked a lot about, uh, you know, light body, medium body, heavy body, uh, you know, depending on what implant system you're using, there's different recommend, recommendations from every implant system. But most importantly is how stable that impression coping is in the impression, uh, making sure there's enough uh, material around it, making sure that there's not a gap around it, making sure that it's not moving. Because if it's moving and we're pouring stone in it, it's not going to be accurate. The contacts will be off, the occlusion will be off. Um, so those are things to, to look out for. Uh, this is just an example. I, I wanted to share it because this has a bunch of uh, do not do's when it comes to impressions, uh, implant impressions. So one um, is that the impression coping, this is not an impression coping. This is actually a temp cylinder. And probably the reason used is trying to save cost on it because there was going to be a temp crown made or for some reason. And we're not using impression coping. But the, the problem is that it's not, it's not, when you have impression coping is in, uh, designed to snap in place and not tear the impression, which a, a temp cylinder does. The other problem with it is not engaging for a single crown. You know, you need to have a hex orientation because it's going to rotate or what's going to happen is that we'll use a hex analog, obviously, and we're going to put it in and that hex um, orientation will be different from what the mouth is and not fit. Um, the other thing is when you're doing uh, an impression for an implant and you have an implant screw this is obviously not an implant uh, impression coping but when you have a screw you want to block out that the nipple that's in the inside so you don't get this because when we're trying to put specifically a closed tray impression coping back it can bounce and bind um, and the other thing is it's a triple tray like this is a plastic tray and plastic tray should not be used for implants because of all the other things i've mentioned the with regards to digital impressions, um, yes, they have, they're better, but they have their own challenges. So with digital impressions on, well, this specifically implants, what you want to kind of make sure is that that uh, scan and that um, scan body is visible, especially those flat surfaces. Because what, what essentially the lab is doing is that there's a digital uh, scan body, a copy of it, that we got to put these three dots. And then those three dots, we mark it on, the actual scan and it lines it up. And if we can't see those same services and market, the computer software won't allow us to line it up and fabricate a model. Um, so it's important to have that uh, visible. And it's also important to, you know, with, with scan bodies to do um, an x-ray, make sure that they're seated. Um, it's not any different than an analog in, uh, implant impression. The other challenge is um, with scan bodies too, there are distortions uh, that uh, can happen with overscanning, which I'll talk about. Um, and when we're trying to line up those scan bodies, uh, there's actually in the library, uh, you can actually select, you know, a 3.5 versus a three. Um, and then sometimes they work. Um, so if you don't specify what scan body you're using, um, then it's leaving up to the lab to either guess or call and, and find out because uh, sometimes both can work. And then what happens, you're going to have a wrong uh, app model made. The other thing with digital impressions, you want to make sure that they're dry. Um, you know, this is just a model that we have. Um, you can see the margins. We did a scan of it. Margins are clear. We added some water on it, did a scan, and you'll start seeing that the scan, the margins are not that clear. And again, it's just guesswork. Yes, there was probably a margin here, but what happens over here, we're probably guessing from A to B. Another thing to uh, be uh, vigilant about on uh, digital impressions is voids. Um, you know, when, when you have an incomplete scan, and yes, it's hard, it's a matter of twisting your wrist and capturing contacts, but sometimes they're more difficult. When you don't capture that, what the computer software actually does, it, it actually fills in the space and stitches it. So it creates, like you're missing a contact, it creates a contact. And this is, um, basically an overlay where the blue is actually the, it was actually a pickup impression that shows the contact. Um, and the, the brown is, was the digital scan that was actually stitched. And you see how different it is. And we're building up a contact. Now you're gonna have an open contact because the computer software was off. Um, another thing to be vigilant about during scans is the stitching of it, right? Um, the stitching, the, the stitching, uh, sometimes with, when you're when you're scanning it, uh, you can over scan something and create uh, incompatible stitches. So when you're looking at stuff like this, you can see that it's all rough, 
and jaggedy. And if that's not what it's in the mouth, if it's not a feeling or issue, um, then you know that there's an issue with that scan. But the ability with the, the best thing about a scanner, um, yes, it, 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 it takes away um, issues with impressions, uh, material, um, but the best thing is that you can actually see it, right? A lot of the times when you're looking at analog impressions, it's hard to tell. Is it good enough? Is it distorted? And you really don't get to know until once it's poured up and you actually see a stone copy of it. And then you can actually see the distortions or the drags or whatever it is. Um, but with the digital scan, you can look at that, rotate the image. Um, you can actually just crop out this one area and rescan it if that's the issue. Um, you can see occlusal clearance, right? A lot of the times, especially on the lance molars, on an analog, you, you're prepping it and you can't really see, you know, is that lingual cusp enough clearance for the crown? But with this, you can actually rotate look. So it's just a matter of, it's better because you can double check the work before sending it while the patient's in the chair. Um, so another thing with digital denture impressions, not too many people know, a lot of these softwares clean up the scan. So when you're trying to scan edentulous, when is that, when, because there's not, um, a lot enough characterization markings like of the of the teeth what the software ends up doing um it it, it has a, an artificial intelligence that cleans up the scan and the reason why is that it, you're able to send the files in smaller uh as a smaller file size and it's great for crown and bridge but when you're trying to scan dentures it actually crops it so there is a ways to like disable that ai function um so you don't actually end up with a short um scan where you're trying to do a chrome framework and you're missing part of it and it's part of the tissues um, so you can just something to be aware of um, the other thing like i said the biggest advantage is double checking the ability to see the patient in the chair um, this is just over scanning distortions um, you can actually see it so when you send this to the lab before sending it to the lab you can actually look and see that this is not a margin here. There's something that's being cropped and, and, and blurred out. And same thing with here. So if it's not crisp and clean, you're able to do a rescan of the patient while they're in the chair and send that information and, 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 and get it uh, done properly the first time. Regarding digital pickup impressions, oh, sorry, not digital, regarding pickup impressions of dentures, um, uh, another challenge we see a lot is when, you know, you want to add a tooth to a partial. Sometimes we'll get um, a denture separate from an impression. And the thing is when the tissues compress differently than um, when you're taking an impression of something. So what ends up happening, if you send it separately, the denture won't seat on the model because there will be stone. The, the, the stone doesn't flex or it's not forgiving. It's not going to seat the same. So when you're doing repairs or doing it, it needs to be a pickup impression so that we actually can seat it on the model extract teeth if we have to add teeth or whatever it may be when doing pickup impressions a thing just to note whether you're pouring this in your own office um, it's actually better to use a pvs material than alginate um, sometimes with alginate materials when they shrink or they're very flexible sometimes that that um, stone can get underneath and actually dislodge or displace the 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 denture which actually embeds it into the stone and it, it's going to be inaccurate once you actually go and repair it um, so now I'm going to just talk about records, shade selection, photos of shade, bites, and study, study models. So one thing to note is that in shade selection, uh, it's good to note, note the brand of shade guide you're using because not any A2 is alike. When you're talking about A2 from different brands of shade guides, they're different shades. So you may have one shade guide and it's saying A2 on a prescription and the lab is using another shade guide with A2 on the prescription. That being said, even using the same brand, you can be saying I use a Vita shade guide, right? It depends on what type of uh, version of shade guide you have. Um, you know, Vita has been along, uh, the Vita Classic has been along for a long time and um, they actually recommend you replace them almost two to three years because they actually discolor over time. And, you know, we notice that in the lab because we keep updating our shade guides and having the newest one. Um, but if you're using an older shade guide, it may be discolored. So your A2 may not be an A2 that we have in the lab as technicians. Um, so it's good to always have a current shade guide. And I know if you talk to your, your Vita rep, they'll help you with that. Um, the other thing is variety of shades. So uh, Classic has been around since 1956. 
Um, but since then, in 2007, Vita kind of noticed that, you know, there's not enough um, shades in that classic shade guide. The shade range is not all there. So what ends up happening, yes, you can use it, but there, there will be shades that are not quite there. They're either a little bit lower in value, darker, um, a little bit more chroma. And that's why they came up with the Vita shade, uh, the, the Vita 3D shade guide, because now you have a, a, a broader range um, and it's a little bit more, um, the chances you're going to have a little bit more accuracy in matching that uh, tooth uh, for the lab. So essentially we have, we use both. Um, it's good to have both in your office. Um, shade selection. Um, so just, this is just about pictures. Now, a lot of the times we, you, um, you, when you take a picture of a shade tab in the mouth, um, and the patient's tooth, uh, um, this is a, I, I did a gradient uh, to kind of compare to show an example of what I'm trying to state. Um, but this is good for if you want to match an incisal, but not the best if you're trying to show the technician what the shade is or the difference in the shade. Um, another way is this, uh, where you, we've seen this, where the shade is under the tooth. Um, again, um, it's okay, uh, but you still can't match it because what ends up happening when you actually put that shade guide next to each other, so those are the same shade, shade tabs that I have, the same gradients. When it's side by side, because the gradients um, from incisal to uh, the body of it, when this is actually lighter than that, it's just that it, 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 it kind of blends in at the incisal and there's a different chroma on it. But when you have the chroma right next to each other, it's more visible, right? So you may be taking a shade like this and then you know the lab makes a tooth, and especially those single centrals, you wedge that same shade tab in between the two adjacent teeth and now you have that you know single central that's light um so ideally um there's a different i'm going to show it on a later slide uh, where you try to tr uh, position um the shade guide and this is um this is just about location so you know we get this sometimes where you know, the shade is, you know, it could be 2L, 2.5, a little bit of 2M3 in there. I'm going to show the shade tab so the technician, the ceramist can kind of see if it needs to be lighter and darker. But essentially, when you're taking it outside of the mouth or in the, and, and there's a distance away from the crown site, what we're doing as, or what the ceramist is doing at the time is they're looking at the shade tab, which they have on their hand, and they look at the tooth. And they, if, if they see that, well, by the photo, it looks like that there's this is lower in value than the shade tab. When they make the crown, they're going to make the crown lower in value than the shade tab. Um, so, and that's how they're trying to do it. If there are, there's characterizations, they're going to start doing it. So, what, what ends up happening, that's visually what you're trying to do in your mind. And this is just showing an example. If I crop those same uh, photos of the shade tab and put it right next to the tooth, you see that it's not even close. Like it's not really helping because it's going to show that it's lower in value. But realistically, if you saw this in the mouth, it's probably really close to a 2M3. But what happens is there's shadows. Um, there's also light that's being cast on this and it's actually affecting that, that photo that you're ta uh, taking. And it's not as useful for the ceramics as you may think it, it, it is. So one preferred position is um, taking that shade tab and putting, if it's an implant site in between, um, behind or like just next to that surface because they can see the body of it. You know, as the ceramist, like, you know, it, this, the, the general shape of the, the color of the tooth is a 4L 2.5. Um, but we're looking at, you know, there's a little bit more orange there, chroma, some white. So the ceramist can customize that a little bit more and make it a little bit more predictable. The other big thing is stump shades. Um, we don't see enough of them. Uh, yes, for lithium disilic, uh, you know, it's a known, take a stump shade because they're translucent. But with zirconia, zirconia is being more aesthetic as, as, it, as a, uh, new manufacturers make them. They're more translucent, so they look better. But what ends up happening because of the translucency, you start seeing color through it. So it, especially with anteriors, when you're talking about even zirconia, they show some sort of color through it. So it's good to use a stump shade. And we recommend you always buy a stump shade. Worst case scenario, if you don't, you could use a back of a shade guide and you can get some of the shades um, and tell the lab that um, and they can make a stump out of that. But essentially, you're not going to get this, um, these darker stumps. So it's good to tell the lab what the stump shade is in case they need to do something differently to try to mask that. Regarding, um, sorry, there we go. Uh, regarding um, bites. Um, so a lot of the times we see full arch bites like this. And the challenge with that is um, 
you can't, when you're taking a bite, you can't see if the patient is biting and centric. Sometimes they bite slightly off. And, you know, this was, um, you know, a wax bite that we cut and you can see the hand articulator versus the wax bite. You couldn't see it when the wax bite was in place because it was covered like this and you saw, show it, it shifted. So when we get this, we end up cutting it up and then we start noticing that, you know, we can't use this bite because it's inaccurate. So we're going to have to hand mount that. Um, a better way of doing it is actually quad bites is um, we don't need the full arch. If you syringe some material on one quad and another quad, have the patient bite down. Now you can see that everything is being, the patient's biting in centric, it's midlines match up, you know, that's accurate. And that's all we need to mount the, butt, the case. Um, another thing we see sometimes is the bite uh, before, uh, before it's uh, prepped. Um, you know, the, you can't, we can't mount a case because, uh, like this because what ends up happening, the bite um, is actually just the only index of it is actually the tissues. And as I said, the tissues in an impression are different uh, when the, uh, the impression compresses the tissues versus when a bite is, when there's no pressure on it. Um, so that's not going to be usable to mount. Um, you know, um, another thing with it is that this is not a full arch bite. There are some stops on that. But if you had a full arch bite, you could do a suggestion on that is you do quad bites where you, you, let's say you're prepping the side, you prep it first, you have this side unprepped to hold the bite in, uh, stable, you take a bite here, then you can go and redo your temps here. Now you prep this side, take a bite, and now you send the lab two quad bites and you then you temporize this. So now you essentially kept that bite um, at, with a full arch and you didn't lose the vertical on it and the lab still has the two bites that they can mount the prepped model with. So as I said, a lot of the times we cut the bites. Uh, the reason why is that you can't see when it's seated. If we put a bite in place, um, it looks like it's seated, but you know sometimes there's um, you know the bites are more accurate um, or capturing details like in the anatomy and fossas sometimes than the impressions are. So those have to be removed. Um, you know you cut it, you notice that it's high. Remove any distortions. Um, you know it's important to uh, make sure it's seated. Um, and trimmed and articulated uh, properly. Uh, the other aspect, it, what it tells us is if there's distortions. Um, you know, you got to remember, we spent all this time focusing on the master model and doing PVS, and then with the opposing, we're just doing an alginate and we're not paying more attention to it. But if that's off and it were distorted or the alginate shrunk or whatever it may be, it was poured too late in the office, that's going to, if we didn't have a bite and we didn't cut it, it would look like it's seated and you may have issues with fit and, and especially with free ends on those. Free ends are a challenge to get, um, to set in the lab, but um, even in, in, in implants, and this is a good example, a uh, way to avoid that um, is, you know, some implant companies have these bite um, abutments or you could use a higher, higher healing abutment. And what you do is you send that to the lab, you take a bite registration of the mount over top of it, and you send the bite and the abutment in the lab. And now there's an actual distal stop for that. And it's easier and more accurate to mount. And there'll be less adjust adjustments with the case um, instead of being a free end. And you only have this anterior and the posterior can move up and down. Uh, denture mounting, we see sometimes where, you know, the doctor has, patient has a previous uh, denture. You know, you want to try to mount the case and you don't want to make an occlusal rim because the vertical is already good. The state, the, the denture is good. We're just remaking it. Um, we can't mount if you, we get this a lot where, you know, well, we took an impression of the denture and you have the master model, you can use the, the denture to mount the master. And it's not possible because we, we can mount and index the occlusion, but there's no inter, we can't see under the denture and the denture because of that, we don't have a reference to mount this model because we need that underside. So a way to do this is, I mean, you can do it, there's ways to do a chair side, but essentially if the lab is close, you can take a, use the denture as a tray, take a wash in it, have the patient go to the lab with the denture in their hand and the, the lab can actually pour it and mount it really quickly and give the denture back. Um, that's one way to, to save time if you wanna skip a, the, the occlusal rim or follow the steps and make a occlusal rim and take a new bite on it. Um, this picture I want to share, uh, the fact that, you know, if a picture is worth a thousand words, then a study model is worth 10,000. So we don't see study models a lot. You would actually be surprised to see how many cases come in, anterior cases without study models. And, you know, sometimes when you're asking for them, it's like, oh, you know, I didn't like 
Uh, the patient didn't like how the anteriors looked. They wanted more ideal. So we don't take a, a study model of it. But the lab, for a lab, it's, it's still better because what it does, it allows us to, first of all, better than pictures because we can actually matrix it and see it three-dimensionally. But you can use this as a starting point. So what didn't the patient like about it? They didn't like the midline. Was it too short, too long? It allows the lab to make adjustments and we see where, where the patient was at ground zero. And then we can make adjustments from that. Uh, occlusal rims, a, a lot of the times we get occlusal rims in and they're just used now just for taking, you know, centric or taking, mounting the vertical. Um, but, you know, a lot of the times we're missing all that other information that will help uh, reduce the amount of try-ins there are and be successful at just doing a one try-in. So giving that smile, the midlines, the, the canine lines, um, contouring the bite blocks to make sure that, you know, the lip support is there. Um, the lab, having that information will reduce the amount of try-ins and chair assignment and guesswork on that. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, teamwork, relationship, and turnaround. Um, you know, with teamwork, um, it's important to um, respect each other. It's important to provide feedback, uh, whether it's positive or negative, uh, to you, the lab you work with, and, and share the after photos, right? you got to remember, like, the, the ceramists, the technicians don't get to see that, right? So it's always good to see cases in the mouth. Um, you know, with, we share it with the team. The team is able to be, you know, the ceramist that worked on it can look at it. It's like, you know what? I like that. Or they might be like, I could have done this a little bit differently next time. But if you build that relationship, if you teach your team, if you teach your lab to be part of your team, an extension of your team and not just a manufacturer, and you grow together, then you're going to get better work with them. Um, so it's just a matter of training and working with them. Another example is, is actually improving together um, with literature. Like I know I have one dentist that sends articles of things that they, they learned that are interesting. Hey, Mike, take a look at this. What do you think? And, you know, and, and what it's going to do is make us, both of us grow and be better together and do better dentistry. So using your lab as part of your team um, and not just a manufacturer is very key and crucial. Um, communication. Um, using words, like uh, one big thing is, you know, what's the minimal thickness of zirconia? And yes, minimal thickness of zirconia could be 0.3 to 0.6, depending on what type of zirconia uh, you're, you're, the brand you're using and where it's located in the mouth. But you got to think, um, the question shouldn't be about what's the minimal thickness. Um, because what you're essentially asking is, how, what's the minimal thickness of that material that I can get away with it before it breaks, right? Ideally, what you should be asking, what's the ideal thickness, right? And with ideal thickness, you're talking about a mil, uh, 1.5 to 2 mils, because that's going to give the proper structure for the crown. And you won't have issues with breakage and, and, and fracturing when there's proper thickness. Um, prepping with chamfers, giving you more space instead of knife edges. That's going to give more ideal. So there's always a battle between, you know, offices and labs. Labs always want more space. Doctors are trying to get away with it. Uh, less space, obviously because of um, not to over prep. But, but there is, um, an, you got to understand that there's a sacrifice. When you're not going to prep them off, you're sacrificing the integrity of the crown and what you could and the benefits you can get from that crown. Another trick is like before sending it, you can hold up that impression if it's a triple tray to the light. If you see light through it, it's too thin. It, it just, you need to prep more on it and then send it, take a new impression and send that. Another thing to think about is uh, turnaround time. So a lot of the questions are asked, you know, are focused around turnaround and, and there's different factors why labs turn around cases differently in different times. It's, you know, there's obviously work and waiting in queue. There's the type of machinery and technology that they're invest, investing in, there's staffing. Um, but more importantly, it's quality control and rework, right? Labs are checking their, their work at different points. And when there's a case, if there's not enough time given um, for turnaround time because you want it faster, there's a chance at QC, like there's, you know, there's chances that, you know, labs see an issue with the product and want to remake it from scratch, but there's not enough time. And then there's a phone call and then the patient has to be rebooked. And then there's issues with that. Um, so respecting lab turnaround time and not trying to rush a, a lab, um, you know, your lab will appreciate that a lot more. Just, and whatever the turnarounds, just respect what those are. Um, another thing that affects turnaround time that we, we don't always think about is, is having complete information. So, 
missing information on Rx or not communicating changes. So not, not having, you know, the shade, what's going to happen is that now the lab has to call you and ask for a shade, or if there's missing information of what type of material, then they have to call. And not always is, you know, dentists are very busy. They're not available. Usually when we call an office, the answer is going to be, oh, the doctor's with the patient right now. They'll call you back. We wait for a call back. Nothing calls back. It's the next day. We call back again. I didn't have a call back. And then it ends up delaying the case one or two days. And that, and then we're still trying to keep meet the patient's turnaround time. And it's cutting into that. And that's where, again, you're going to sacrifice on the quality of the case. Um, you know, not communicating uh, challenges. Sometimes, you know, there's a very awkward bite. Um, and, you know, you took a bite decision, you know about it, maybe the patient was in a car accident, but you send it, but don't write anything about that in the, in the RX. When the lab mounts it, they're going to be like, oh, something's off here. Maybe I now I need to call the doctor. Again, that's going to delay your work. And if you just write, hey, patient was in a car accident. Yes, the bite is very awkward. Uh, please mount as is. It's going to save it that call and, and that um, time. Um, so again, the other factors is just about shipping and that availability of your answers. So uh, one, one thing I don't know if all offices do, but you know, is yes, respect turnaround time of what the lab is telling you, um, what their turnaround time is, but putting buffer dates in. So, you know, it's, it, I think it's best practice uh, when you write a prescription um, to book your patient actually one to two days after the day that you write on the prescription. So give the lab their five days if that's what they ask for, but schedule the push in in seven days, right? Because if there is a problem at QC, you're not having to call that patient back. It gives enough time for the lab when they call, so listen, I have an issue. They're like, don't worry, get it remade. The patient's not, I have another two days. Um, it doesn't look bad, but when you're really tight on the schedule um, and then that's when the patient has to be rescheduled, it causes issues. Uh, a little bit now we're going to get into the implant uh, place, uh, placements. I'm just about um, restorative challenges that we see and how to plan with the end in mind. So with implant uh, placement, one thing to consider when you're taking an implant impression is to actually look at um, before taking your impression is that implant's placed. Take a look at the adjacent contacts. It's always good to make these contacts flat and broad ideally parallel with the implant, because that's going to prevent these um, black triangles that you have in here. Um, it's very difficult to, um, for a lab to, uh, like, well, it's easy for a lab to make that contact flat and then build out the contact so it touches. And now you have to do that chair side and make that same adjustment. It is guess, it's a bit of guesswork. It's a challenge, I think, for, for a dentist in the office to not remove so much in, uh, of the contact or not to under, remove the contact and plastic the contact and now the crown is in C. So it, it makes it difficult. So it's always good before sending the impression, take a look, see if you need to flatten those contacts, make them broader so they're not point contacts. The other thing is implant placement being too shallow. This is something we see often as well. Not going uh, deep enough. When you look at a case like this, um, you know, it looks like the, imp the why, you know, why wasn't this brought out more? And the reason why is that the platform's right here. So when you look at the CEJs, for us to bring it out to the same plane, um, you're going to have this like ridge lap. So if the implant was placed deeper, you know, ideally three millimeters below the CEJ, you can give it, it's easier to give a better profile, emergence profile on that. So placing it too shallow is usually an issue we see. Uh, too lingual, you know, sometimes when they're too lingual, they're shallow, but lingual, um, you know, same issue. You want to fill out that uh, buckle uh, corridor and you know, the only way to do that is to add, this is a wax to show an example, um, but essentially now you have a bit of a food trap there because you're trying to deal with aesthetics. So if that implant wasn't so lingual, again, merge the profile. Um, another big one we see is uh, implants being too facial, um, but, you know, there's advantages now with uh, ASC. Um, there's a lot of things you can correct um, to a point, you know, sometimes when they're too far facial, the ASC abutment, uh, is already too facial from the surface of the adjacent crown. Um, then you might have to do something different like cement retain. Um, but planning that, um, so how do you, you know, make, how do you prevent these things from happening? It, it starts with, you know, a diagnostic wax up, you know, prosthetically driven cases, you know, with, when you do a diagnostic wax up, you can actually, uh, plan the case, know where the tooth spacing, spacing is. It also helps with tooth reduction. Um, but, you know, 
understanding where we want to go with the case and placing implants um, where they need to be uh, to be prosthetically driven. So if you have to do bone grafts, don't just place implants where the bone is, because that might not be where restoratively, restoratively where you need to be. You know, there are tool, uh, tools like guides and there's different types of lab, uh, there's lab guides and fully guided cases. You know, lab guides uh, essentially just give you, you know, your mesial distal spacing, but it's not gonna give you a buckling position. It won't give you your depth. It won't give you your angle. It's used for your initial pilot osteotomy. Um, it's good to give your spacing of where to start it, um, but pretty much you're freehanding that after. Um, the other option is fully guided cases where it can actually, you plan it, you can actually get the implant exactly to the depth angle, um, buckling or position that you need. Um, but just to note of that being said, um, you know, it's always good to have, I mean, in order to make this, you should make a radiographic guide. And this is also a radiographic slash lab guide because the teeth are radio opaque, but it can also be used as a lab guide because it has the access, the, the screw, the, the channels in it. Um, but it's good to have both because, you know, if something happens where this drops, it breaks or any issues, you know, on day of surgery, you can always resort back to the lab guide and use that and freehand it, right? So it's always good to have both tools in that and when planning cases. A lot of the times we, we don't, surgeons are not planning those cases. A lot of the times it's the restorative doctor um, is, you know, having a surgeon place it and, you know, the restorative doctor is not communicating with the restore, uh, with the surgeon of where they want the implants and stuff like that. And then afterwards, you're kind of dealing with, okay, how do I restore this? Or now, I'm, you know, the implants are already in and integrated. What do I do now? So it's good to get involved early and communicate early with the full team. Um, I think I'm going to end there because uh, I know there's going to be some times Ali wants to talk about uh, questions and answers. Um, but uh, you know, that's my email up there. If you guys want to send me emails afterwards with questions, um, I am available. Um, there's a QR code to our website as well. Um, but anytime, I'm here for you. All right. Thank you so much, Michael. I know I am very much biased, but I do have to say you had great content and you are a great presenter. So um, I, I personally enjoyed it. I hope everybody um, enjoyed it too. We have some uh, some of the participants uh, having their hand raised virtually. Um, I presume you guys have questions. If you do, please put it in the question and answer, and we'll try to get to them as uh, as uh, as fast as possible. That's the only way we can answer questions. Type them in the Q and A. Michael, for your information, we have five questions which was emailed to us uh, during the registration. We have nine questions already in the Q and A lined up. So. Uh, you, you're going to try to answer questions as fast as possible to be mindful of uh, people's time here. So the first question, do you prefer all bike registration in CR? Um, yeah, so, well, it depends on what you're doing. If it's, if it, if you, if you're, if, if it's a full denture or full arch case, um, uh, yes, um, but if, if you're just doing a single crown, then a central occlusion is good enough. Good enough. All right. Can you elaborate on some shade selection? Uh, not sure what you mean by that. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So if uh, the person who asked that question can try the question in a different way, that would be great. Um, uh, we have a question. How do you send feedback with the picture of crown or bridge in the mouth? Email or text? Um, you can, you can, I mean, you can use WhatsApp. It's it encrypted. Um, or use, uh, comp like you can use WeTransfer. Um, you know, you just got to make sure you're not putting patient's name and obviously their privacy there, but whatever way you work with your lab and communicate with them will work fine. Just how, however your lab uh, communicates with you is a way that you could communicate with them. All right, that's great. Um, is chamfer better than modified shoulder for zirconia crown? Perhaps I may have missed this uh, prior, so maybe you have answered it, but um, can you please uh, answer that? Um, both are good. Um, just keep in mind, sometimes with uh, zirconia, they don't like sharp edges. Um, so 
Um, with the shoulder, I would say it was a little bit more forgiving um, for the mill to actually reach and, and, and shape it properly. Um, also, when you're prepping those sharp edges, um, you want to round off um, because in the software, the cement gap, they're going to have to make bigger because those sharp edges can cause those zirconia to fracture. All right, do this stuff. We, we have a comment, uh, and I appreciate the comment, so I'm just going to read it out. Our lab can't make us shine if we don't give them adequate, accurate information to work with us. Labs do amazing things for us. Uh, thank you so much for your comment. Uh, we have another comment. Uh, it's not a question, but maybe you want to comment back, Michael. I find the more I write on Rx, the less they read. Um, it's a good point, actually. Um, make sure there's actually one slide I didn't show um, where you know there was a prescription for a single molar crown and it was three pages long. And like anybody, just there, what ends up happening when you start writing extra information, it it makes it less appealing for every single technician that that case goes through to have to read everything, um, and 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 actually pull from there what's relevant information, what's not relevant information. So being um, point form on a prescription, concise, exactly what you need to talk to them is a better way than writing a whole page story of, on it. All right. Michael, we have uh, more question coming in. Right now we have 15 open questions. So uh, we're gonna go through them as fast as possible. Um, what can I provide to have less adjustments on my night guards? Um, it comes down there, there's a way, there's a way to take a bite for a night guard. Um, so what ends up happening with adjustments on night guards, most cases you're taking the bite, the a patient bite close. The lab has to articulate that on an articulator. And if it's not a face bone mount, which most of the case on night guards, we're not doing, um, that articulator doesn't open up the same. So when you're trying to open two to three millimeters and we're opening it up in the lab, that's not gonna relate the same opening as the, what the patient has in the mouth. So a better way to do that is actually using something like a leaf gauge. Um, you know, have the patient bite, bite down on the leaf gauge on the anterior, um, adjust the leaf gauge so there's about two to three millimeters posterior opening. And you can actually scan the patient like that or syringe bite material in, in between there and you're capturing the patient in an open bite. And now we're making a night guard exactly to that bite. So that will eliminate a lot of adjustments. All right. Um, this question has been asked multiple times. Could, I, could we get a link to the recording of the webinar? The answer is yes. We're gonna upload this webinar on our YouTube channel. So it is youtube.com uh, backslash Shaw Lab Group. Um, there are more webinars there that you can watch as well. So please feel free to go to that channel and subscribe. Once uh, the video is uploaded, you will get notified by YouTube directly. We are uh, on Instagram as well, at Charlap Group, on LinkedIn, at Charlap Group, on Facebook, at Charlap Group as well. So you can find us there. There's a lot of content that you can, you can see. But thank you so much for your interest in watching the recording as well. Um, so this question, what's your turnaround time for a single zirconial crown? Um, most labs are going to, you're going to have between five to seven days. Um, but essentially most labs, if you talk to them, it's about five days, um, in lab. And that doesn't include shipping. You got to remember, um, especially now the couriers are not exactly next day shipping anymore. Um, you know, they're also in reduced staff. So sometimes it takes two days to get somewhere. Um, but calculate at least five days in the lab is giving your lab that time. All right, we have a comment. Thanks for the nice presentation. Uh, thank you so much for that. Do you prefer, this is a question, do you prefer to take the bite before prep? Before prepping, no. Don't take a bite before prep. So it's kind of that slide I, 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 sh I showed on it. Um, you, the most important part of that bite registration is, is the distance between the prep and the opposing. Because you can take a bite, uh, index the, the adjacent teeth, and especially if those teeth are distorted in the impression, we're trying to chop that bite down and we're left with not much left. Um, but if you take it and, and we, we don't have a reference in that one spot between the prep. So essentially that's the most important part of the bite is just above the prep. So no. All right. Um, to make it, uh, uh, to make a grind guard for upper, do you need impressions for upper and lower or just upper? Upper and lower. Upper and lower. 
is uh, a single uh, tooth bite uh, when making crown acceptable? A single tooth bite? When making crown acceptable. Um, I think if, if you're, again, I think it's back to that same question. If you're talking about the bite, as long as it's over the prep in that one area, you can just fill that one little area and that that's more than enough for us to mount the, the case. Or as long as it's not a free end, free ends are a little bit more trickier. We don't want a bit more on that. All right. Um, so I usually take a, a treatment impression and send the models so, so the lab can see what the tooth looked like before I prepped it. Does the lab ever use this model as um, the base in making new crown or are intraoral picture enough? Um, so that was that slide I kind of talked about a study model. So an intraoral photo is two dimensional. Um, we can't uh, really use that. We're looking at it and we're just eyeballing when we're designing a crown. But, but if you actually, like you said, you take a pre-op uh, study model, uh, we can make a matrix of that and use that as a base or starting point. Um, the only important thing to indicate there is you can write on the RX if, if the patient's happy with it, if they want similar size, or maybe you want to change it and size a longer, make it smaller than what the patient has. But it's better because we can make matrix out of them and, and helps us make our crowns. All right. So we have a comment. Thanks for the amazing and informative webinar. Um, appreciate it. Uh, what's the best way to take a bite for a night guard? So I think I asked that on a, uh, this, I, I answered that on the previous question. Use that okay. leaf gauge, that will help. Okay, got it. And should we always do a verification, Jake, for multiple implant case? Uh, it depends on your lab that you work with. So what a verification jig does um, on a multiple implant case, it verifies the accuracy of the master model. So, you know, some labs are okay with, you know, just two, three implants um, to go ahead and proceed with a case. Um, when it starts getting larger, like a full arch case, like even with us here, full arch case, I, I want a verification jib because if it's off, if that master model is not off, there's so much money that's involved for the lab that goes into it. And then only to find out at the end that the model was off and now we have to remake it. And now the lab is swallowing the cost. So some, depending on what labs, they might say, no, I want it on every case. Um, some will be, you know what, uh, it's okay. So you have to talk to your lab about that. All right. So this is a question that uh, uh, that uh, has come. How come crowns in CEREC machines can be fabricated, ready to insert, and it takes the lab ten days? It doesn't take ten days, but um, but uh, how come CEREC can do it in one day and labs need more time? So, kind of what I did on that other slide. So yes, you can design a crown and computer generate a crown, but there's a lot more than that, that goes into uh, a crown being fabricated in the lab. Yes, there's more steps. We're making models. There's um, different um, procedures and we're putting different details, especially if that's full contour versus um, layering. But what I what I kind of explained on that one slide, it, it, there's a cue and process. You got to remember, you're not, your chair side, you're investing in all this material or equipment to be able to provide something chair side, but in a lab, Yes, we would love every customer to be our only customer, but there's lots of doctors that labs deal with. And we can't just rush and prioritize one customer. There's a sequence and a production line of how things are made. And there's certain QC points that a lab will put into it to verify material. Um, so, you know, you do get a different type of um, turnaround time on that aspect of it. Yeah. Definitely, it's a different technology. We do not use the CEREC technology. It's designed to be chair side and faster uh, to be used by the dentist. Um, um, it, it is a good point. Well, what is the best material to use for bite registration? I feel like you answered this question or you want to? Um, any bite re registration material. There's different ones out there. They all work. It doesn't matter. It's more about... More importantly, it's not your bite registration material, it's your impression material. If you wanna improve it, try to avoid using an alginate, try to using one of those five-day alginates or alginate uh, alternative um, because they're more accurate and you'll the bite will fit into them more accurately. Mm -hmm. 
All right. How long does it take to have a PFM crown uh, made normally? Again, well, it depends on the lab you're dealing with, but it's about five days average right. crowns in a lab. Yeah. All right. So um, the question uh, that we see by email, sometimes my shades are still off, even though I send a patient to my lab. Are there other reasons for this? Yeah. So um, one thing to note, like I didn't cover in my slide, is material choices, right? So a lot of the times, um, you know, a patient wants uh, a cheap full contour zirconia crown, um, and it, they want it on the anterior, but that's not the best choice of material because you can't copy the same aesthetics. They might have to do something more expensive. So we have doctors that, I mean, and I know other labs have doctors that set request a cheaper material. And then the lab is trying to convince the doctor and the patient, you know, what, we need something uh, better or more. Um, another factor is material thickness. Sometimes if you're not prepping enough, like I said, you, you want that 1.5 uh, thickness, the thicker the, the, the material we're making the crown, the more consistent the shade can be. When a shade is very thin and it goes over the top of a stump, it's going to modify that shade. The light will travel through it differently um, and it will affect that. Um, another big thing is like on anterior cases, especially single centrals, one of the hardest things for a lab to mimic and copy, even when a patient comes in here, uh, because we can't put that in the mouth and see how it is in the, in the an actual environment, it makes it difficult. So a suggestion with even those single centrals is, is speak to your lab, try to get a chair side stain appointment um, where uh, some labs have it where they can actually send a technician to you uh, chair side for that appointment in case there's some minor alterations and adjustments. All right. So we are two minutes past uh, the time. There are more questions. We're going to answer the last two questions and I'll stop it there to be respectful of everyone's time. So, uh, you know, one question, do you, uh, what do you need to retrofit a partial denture to a new one? Uh, I'm not sure if the question is asking, like, what, what, what steps you need if you have an old denture and you want to make a new one? Um, what do you need to retrofit a partial denture to a new crown? Oh, Sorry. to a new crown. Sorry, I thought a new one. So uh, to a new crown. Um, essentially sending the denture in. Um, there, there are ways that you can um, do a bite index under the clasping of a denture and the rest area. Um, but the problem with that is that the we the lab will have to do some sort of duralay and fill it but it's not really it's flexible and it's not really accurate in the sense of being very consistent you might have small adjustments with that essentially i know it's hard for the patients to be without the dentures but if you can send a pickup impression um of the partial to the lab um then that will be the best fit because they they can actually once the crown is manufactured they can check the fit and make adjustments if needed all right so um, we do have more questions, but again, if you're five, five minutes past our, uh, the time that we wanted to close, Michael email address is right there. If you guys want to directly email him and ask any question, also feel free to contact any of our locations in um, Shaw GTA, uh, Michael Lino's uh, lab, uh, Shaw London, uh, Ontario, Shaw Kingston, Ontario, and Shaw Ottawa, Ontario. All the information is on our website. I would like to thank you, Mike, again uh, for this great presentation uh, and also thank everyone who attended this webinar. Uh, you know, we were really impressed with the number of registration and number of attendance. Amazing day. Thank you, everyone, and hope to see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you.